This presentation looks at how handles are made for table knives. A wide variety of materials have been used for handles, from simple wooden bone to more ornate types like precious metals, semi-precious stones, porcelain, ivory, mother of pearl and tortoise shell. Over time, handles have been influenced by fashions in dining, the materials available and the changes in technology for their manufacture. Today, many table knives are made from one piece of steel without a separate handle. Where handles are applied, they are generally plastic, although there are still examples of silver or gold plating and wooden handles. Please also see our presentations on materials used for table knives and the short history of the table knife for more on these subjects. Firstly, let's start with some definitions. The ferrule is a metal collar between the bolster on the knife blade and the handle to prevent the handle splitting as well as for decorative purposes. The finial or terminal is a decorative piece applied to the end of the knife handle, often as a fixing on a through tang. Examples are caps, plates, lugs and pommels. Handles can be made in one or more pieces. For example, one solid piece made from horn, bone or ivory, two pieces joined together made from silver, two flat pieces known as scales made from shell, horn or wood, or composite handles with pieces of different materials mainly found in earlier examples made from ivory metals etc. The most popular for table knives are the solid and two-piece types. Handles are attached to the blade by means of a tang, usually formed as part of the blade. For solid or two-piece handles there are different types of whittle tangs. Firstly the pin tang, this is a pointed tang usually half to three quarters of the length of the handle for fixing into handles made from bone, horn or ivory or hollow handles like silver or ceramics. Secondly the knock-on tang, a pointed spike for fixing into wooden handles either hammered into the handle or inserted into a pre-drilled hole. Thirdly, the through tang. This is the same thickness along its length. This goes through the whole length of the handle and can either be bent over a candle end or have a terminal added. For fixing into knife handles made of a variety of materials like horn, bone, mother of pearl, etc. Scale tangs can be either flat or transverse, that is, at a right angle to the blade. In either case, two flat or shaped pieces are attached on either side of the tang using pins or rivets. Solid handles can be made from wood, stone, horn, bone, ivory, mother of pearl or plastics. The first plastics were made from celluloid in the late 1800s. Synthetic plastics made from oil appeared in the 1950s. Xylonite was one of the most widely used. Many handles today are still made from synthetic plastics. The materials are first cut to a suitable initial size. Originally this was done using hand saws or bench mounted circular saws which first appeared in the late 1700s and began to be used more widely in the early 1800s. High speed versions are still used today. The solid tips or ends of the horn and ivory were used as they were, for example for carving sets, whereas buffalo horn was solid all the way through and could be cut like wood but needed to be skinned first. Bone had to be cleaned and bleached before cutting and both horn and bone were sometimes dyed at this stage to give a consistent colour. Mother of pearl, tortoise shell and xylenite needed more careful handling. Pearl could easily be scorched or burnt due to friction when cutting, so the shells were di either dipped in water or the circular saws were water-cooled. Tortoise shell had to be separated from the turtle skeleton by heating before use. Ceramic handles would have been made using liquid clay or slip in moulds. Before the advent of belt-driven machinery in the early 1800s, the shaping was carried out by hand using a pole lathe or pedal-operated lathe. Today, handles are shaped using a variety of machines, for example, rotary turning machines, copy lathes and routers, some of which are computer-controlled. If a smaller amount of shaping were needed, 
This would have been done by hand using carving tools, files or a pedal operated lathe. By the 1700s a grinding wheel was used and later a motorised abrasive wheel. Horn first had to be heated in one of two ways, either in an oven or by boiling in water. The solid horn was then placed between two hot metal dies or moulds and put in a press to give the shape needed. Tortoise shell was also shaped by being softened by boiling in salt water and then flattened and shaped. Care had to be taken not to lose the delicate colouring. Bone handles were sometimes jigged or made to look like horn with lines and ridges being cut into them using a file or a lathe and cutting tool. Ivory and pearl handles often had decorative patterns or finishes applied like fluting or chipping again using carving tools or files. In the 1700s, to reduce cost, solid silver handles were replaced with handles made from two parts, cast in identical moulds and soldered together. By the 1760s, even thinner and lighter silver handles were being stamped out of sheet silver and later EPNS, electroplated nickel silver, using a drop stamp or press and dies or moulds. Some would have been gilded to look like gold. For these, and scales, the skill of the die sinker or the mould maker was important. Dies could be very intricate, making beautiful impressed patterns on the finished handle or scale. Scales, or two handle pieces attached to a scale tongue to form a handle, are thicker in materials like wood, but with horn, tortoiseshell, pearl, ivory and bone are usually thin. The thinner parts of pearl shells and the hollow parts of ivory were shaped on a lathe or grinding wheel to the correct shape and thickness. Bone was dealt with in a similar way with any final shaping made using a chipping bill or carving tool. After warming, slices of horn and tortoiseshell were cut to the approximate size and placed between two hot iron plates or dies and put in a press as for solid handles. A short bladed knife was then used to trim off any excess. This whole process had to be carried out while the materials were still warm, so that they were only in the press for a short time. Mechanised presses were introduced later in the mid-1800s. Xylonite scales were produced in the same way, by heating and placing in a mould. There are early examples of knives with composite handles made from pieces of several different materials, for example metals with ivory. The pieces would have been made separately by casting or forging for metals and shaping as above for other materials like ivory. Each piece would be sized so they would fit together to form the handle. This would have been a complex and skilled task. Other embellishments on handles included fluting or carving, as already mentioned, as well as pique and damascening. Pique was a technique of inlaying gold or silver into handles and scales which could be made of horn, ivory bone, mother of pearl, tortoiseshell or plastic. There are two forms, pose, where strips are inlaid into the material appearing as lines, and clute, where points or dots formed a pattern. Damascening is the inlaying or encrusting of a metal, for example gold, silver or copper, into the surface of another metal. A groove is first made in one metal with a chisel or stamp. Wire, thread or leaf of the second metal is then placed and hammered into the groove. All the handles and scales would need to be smoothed and polished. Originally this would have been done entirely by hand by rubbing using an abrasive material like emery or by using a succession of rotating dollies or buffing wheels starting with emery on leather moving through to calico or linen discs to give a smooth, glossy, shiny finish. Later, moving belts covered with abrasive material and today a combination of belts and machines like mechanical tumbling machines are used, some being computer controlled. Records indicate that bone was also dipped or wiped with turpentine as part of the finishing process. For pearl, by the 2000s, the local firm Gillettes used buffing wheels for flat pieces like scales and tumbling machines filled with waste shell and dilute acid for solid handles. Handles made from wood may also be dyed or waxed and lacquered. The solid handle is bored, that is a hole is drilled down the centre from the top to take the tang of the knife blade. As already mentioned, the tang can go part or all of the way through the handle. 
Up to the 1800s and in smaller workshops, wood boring tools like augers or hand operated centre drills would have been used to bore the holes in the handles. Otherwise, a belt driven horizontal or vertical drilling machine would have been used. Traditionally, the handle was drilled in short bursts, the waste material being removed each time. As well as preventing blockages, this helped to ensure that the hole ran exactly down the centre of the handle. Similar motor-driven drilling machines and high-carbon steel worm drills are used today. As Ken Hawley explains here, the handle of the knife has to balance and sit nicely on the table. If the handle is too light, the knife blade will tip and touch the table. To prevent this, hollow handles made from silver or ceramics were loaded or filled with resin, sometimes mixed with ash, for strength and to increase their weight. And solid handles could have extra pieces of lead added into the hole for the tang. For more intricate knives, it would be the cutler who put the knife together. This could include carrying out a number of tasks. One might be making the holes for the tang or for the pins and rivets. The smaller holes would have been made using a bow drill or parser. That's a horizontal drill operated using a wooden bow, as you can see in this image. The tang holes might also have been made using a drill. It could also involve making ferrules and finials if these had not been supplied by silversmiths. Through tangs would also need to be finished or bent as necessary. And as mentioned, it was important that the finished knife was correctly balanced as well as looking good. And it was the skill of the cutler which ensured this. More mass-produced solid handles were assembled by being knocked on, that is the tang was knocked into the hole in the handle using a hammer. Some glue may be added into the hole first for extra strength. And there you had your finished knife, ready for cleaning and packing.